Hey guys, Sebastian here with another Cardano video. This time I'm going over the formal specification for Cardano Wallet. So, uh, this video is going to be a bit more technical, but hopefully it should be fairly easy to understand even with, without a super technical background. Uh, so, why do we need a formal specification? Uh, basically, when you're writing software, you have kind of two ways to do it. You can try and write the code, and then as the problems come up, you try and fix them. Uh, the other way, which uh, is the approach taken here, is first thinking about the problem uh, mathematically. What kind of problem are we trying to solve? What kind of uh, properties does this problem have? Uh, what's the optimal way to solve this problem? And we figure all that out, we write a document about it, and then when we write the code, we just refer to this document and this is our like a reference implementation. And so that's what this formal specification is. So we're gonna go through the entire uh, document, 35 pages, so it's gonna be a fairly long presentation. Uh, but hopefully it makes sense. Uh, I think the hardest part of this presentation is actually the beginning uh, because we're actually going to be defining a lot of terminology uh, that we're going to be using for the rest of this presentation. So hopefully uh, after, if you manage to survive this kind of hardest part, uh, everything after that uh, should be fairly smooth. So let's start with some definitions, right? So one of them is a transaction ID. Uh, so what this means is that this is a variable and this is a type. Right, so say we have a type transaction ID, you can imagine it's just some number uh, re uh, representing some hash, and so we have uh, transaction IDs. Uh, the other one is we have a uh, transaction indices. Uh, so you can imagine in a transaction, we, ha we can have uh, multiple inputs, we can have multiple outputs, and this is according to the UTXO model that uh, Cardano uses for the settlement layer. If you aren't uh, familiar with the uh, UTXO model, I have a picture right here, which I think is actually probably a big cut for you guys. Uh, but essentially the idea is for every uh, transaction, uh, see, see here you have, uh, you know, for example, transaction two over here, uh, you have one input and then multiple outputs. Uh, and this all comes from the Genesis block. So for example, like uh, this input has a uh, 50K Satoshi's coming in uh, probably 10 k Satoshi's are used as like a transaction fee and then the output is the sum of the inputs plus the transaction fee uh, so this is where you get your uh, 50 from right so you can imagine if you have a transaction you can uh, take in your input which is uh, your UTXO from your uh, previous uh, transaction and you say okay here's uh, my input and split it to multiple people but similarly you can also have multiple inputs uh so you can take you know here's like a one utxo which is an output that's not used anywhere so you could take uh this utxo plus a utxo from here like imagine this transaction exists and like uh, these are like input one or actually you can i mean you can see down here this one right here actually has like a two inputs so it's possible to have multiple inputs in a transaction and so we need inputs for coming in inputs for coming out and uh, when you think about how much uh, ADA or how much Bitcoin or whatever do I hold personally, uh, you look at all these uh, UTXO in the blockchain, these unspent outputs, uh, and you check, uh, do I have the private key for this, right? And if I have the private key for this, uh, that means this is my UTXO and I own any balance that's in here. So maybe like, uh, for example, this is 30K Satoshi's in, uh, maybe 10 was spent for the transaction fee. So this output here represents uh, 20K Satoshi's. So I have, you know, 20K plus like a maybe, you know, this that one down here also belongs to me. And this one's 10K, so I have like a 10K Satoshi's. And you would sum this up for the entire blockchain. And in total, you would have, you know, a 30K Satoshi's or whatever your total balance is. So that's how you find your balance in a UTX tool model. Uh, so that's why we need uh, both the concept of indices and also the concept of addresses. Uh, and hopefully they should be familiar if you know uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, finally, we have this concept of coin. So what is a coin? Uh, kind of the definition that's used here is just a number, right? So it's going to be 0, 1, 2, any uh, integer uh, that's uh, greater or equal to 0. 
and then coins can be added together. So you can say like a coin plus coin equals like some new coins. So you, you can think of it as just like a, instead of coin, just think like a integer or just number here. It might be easier to understand. Uh, next up, we have some more complicated types based off these primitives, right? So one of them is the uh, transaction, right? So a transaction is just a pair of inputs and outputs. Okay, so what is a pair of inputs and outputs? Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, we have to have some inputs uh, to our transaction. So what is an input, right? An input is just a transaction ID uh, with an index. So if you think back over here, uh, you have some transaction ID and then some index, which is uh, within your inputs, right? So that makes sense as a definition for a transaction input, right? So it's a transaction ID followed by an index. Okay, and then we need to have this concept of transaction outputs. Okay, so what is transaction output? Transaction output is just an address along with a coin value, right? And hopefully this makes sense. Uh, you send money to an address and you put how much uh, you want to send to it, right? So then what, what is a transaction? It's a power set. So if you don't know power set, it means like all the possible uh, ways to take subsets of a larger set of elements. Uh, so you have the uh, power set of inputs, right? So it could be zero inputs, could be one, could be two, could be three, any any set, uh, along with a mapping. Uh, if you know, so imagine you took, you know, uh, transaction one, transaction two, transaction three. Uh, you need to have some sort of uh, mapping of okay, this one, the index uh, zero goes to here, and next one goes to here, and next. So it goes to here. And this will be like different address coin pairs. This will be different address coin pair, address coin pair. So you take a set of inputs and then you have a function that says, okay, for the first input, go here. For the second input, go here. For the third input, go here. And that's what a transaction is. UTXO, uh, slightly different, uh, but similar in concept, is uh, mapping from a transaction input to a transaction output. Right, so let's just say uh, you take a transaction, an existing transaction, and the index in it, right? So you take an existing transaction and an index in it, and then uh, you associate with it uh, address and uh, coin. So let's just say like uh, this UTXO uh, belongs to address blah, 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 and it has a certain uh, coin value. So that seems to make sense, right? So then now what is a block? Well, think about it, a block is just the power set of transactions, right? So you can imagine maybe in this picture over here, transactions three and four uh, form some block in the blockchain, right? So it's just a set of uh, transactions. And similarly, we have a set of pending transactions. Let's just say, uh, imagine I'm running my wallet and I've want, I want to send money to this person and send money to this person, uh, but they haven't been uh, entered into the blockchain yet. They're still in the mempool. Uh, this represents a power set of transactions, which is uh, some set of transactions I've sent, uh, but I've not been included in the blockchain yet. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, two helper functions. One is uh, given a transaction, you get the ID from it. And the other one is a function called ours. And it takes an address and gives a Boolean, which is true or false, whether or not this address belongs to us. Right, so now we can create these two filters. One is uh, address ours. So it takes a set of addresses and uh, gives it back all the addresses that belong to ours. So let's say we give it like address one, two, three. You might say, okay, like a two and one belong to you. So this is your new set. Uh, next is a transaction out ours. And uh, it's similarly, you just take all the addresses that are ours and you attach the coin value to all of them. All right, so hopefully uh, these definitions make sense. If not, you feel free to pause the video and think about it for a second. Uh, but for now, we're moving on to the next definition. So these are some operators uh, that we'll need to reason about uh, performance of certain operations. Okay, so imagine we have our UTXO right here and we want to filter it to a subdomain, right? Uh, we write this with a triangle uh, along with a set of inputs. Right, so this uh, operation means take the UTXO, 
and filter down to everything where the inputs belong to this set right here. Right, so you can see uh, UTXO, as we said before, UTXO is an input to output. And we're saying the inputs are restricted to this other set we pass right here. We can have the opposite operation, which is a, a exclusion. So we take a UTXO uh, where the inputs are not part of a set of inputs, right? And then we can also have a tricky arrow. Uh, and I say tricky arrow because you have to remember that uh, this arrow is in the opposite direction. So whenever you see an arrow, think about the directions it's going towards and that changes whether it's a domain restriction range a restriction. But so what we're saying is, okay, let's take the UTXO uh, where the outputs belong to a set of outputs, right? So we have some sort of UTXO where we wanna make sure our output belong to some like, set we give here. Okay, and with that, we get a, a set of, of properties. Uh, and I think they're all uh, pretty simple to think about, right? So if we have a UTXO U and we restrict it down to a set where uh, the inputs are included in set ins, now, obviously, since we've taken stuff out, it must be smaller than the UTXO itself, right? I think the only one that's like a slightly tricky is uh, this one down here. This is say if you take uh, the domain of the UTXO and you add in some inputs and you consider uh, filtering out uh, all these things from the set of UTXOs use, uh, union, uh, a set of UTXOs Vs, uh, then this must be at least the size of everything in here, right? Because you've taken everything from it, plus you added some new stuff. Uh, so you can essentially take it out, right? So you can see on the right hand side, we're down with only V, we've like a slashed out the U. Uh, but it's possible some stuff from U was still included in V, we never mentioned anywhere, these are mutually exclusive. And so the left hand side part, or I should say like this uh, left, left part over here uh, stays the same. Uh, but if, hopefully if you, if you pause this video and you check through all these, uh, you know, they should all be uh, not too hard to reason about. And there's a proof for one of them not here if you want to see like a, what a more formal proof of what one of these statements would look like. Uh, so we, we defined two operations, uh, which are pretty intuitive. One is just uh, when when is U a subset of V, right? So we say uh, for UTXO U, a set of UTXO U and a set of UTXO V, uh, U is part of V if for every uh, UTXO and U, uh, that uh, UTXO is also in V. All right, and that seems to be uh, fairly intuitive. The trickier one is this like a square bracket includes, uh, which is a subset of not of uh, individual UTXOs, but of transactions themselves in the UTXO, right? So essentially what we're saying is if we have a transaction that is part of U, then that transaction itself uh, must be part of V also. Uh, so this is like a, different kind of subset and maybe it will not seem useful for now. Uh, that's because it will come uh, much later on uh, in this presentation. So if it doesn't really make sense now, don't really worry about it. Uh, just keep in mind that we'll have the square includes notation uh, that later on we'll say, okay, if some transactions are new, then the whole transaction must be in V. That's to say, it must contain at least all the parts of the transaction U plus maybe some more parts of the transaction. All right, so moving on. What is the simplest uh, wallet interface you could have? Okay, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of start uh, building this up. And then later on in this presentation, we'll add more complicated features uh, to our wallet uh, that will give us some performance uh, improvements. All right. So what is the interface to our wallet? What, what kind of functions we have on it? Right, well, first thing, we need to have some sort of way of calculating the balance, right? So we'll have total balance, available balance, uh, and I'll describe the, the difference between these two later on. And then uh, we have two functions. Uh, one of them is apply block, 
and the other one is new pinning. So what are these two? So okay, so imagine you have a new block in the blockchain. So this is your first argument to the function, and you have your existing wallets, which is here, right? And this is like a Haskell style uh, notation uh, for uh, functions. So this is like the first argument, second argument, and the last arrow over here represents like a, the output of the function. This is like an oversimplification. Uh, this isn't necessarily the case. It could be that this is the sole uh, input and this is a returns like a function uh, with one argument that returns a result. Uh, but o overall, it's, it's the, the simplest way to think about it. If you're not familiar with this notation, is this oversimplification. We say, okay, the first one's output one, or sorry, input one, input two, and then function output, all right? So the apply block takes a block, a wallet, and uh, adds the block to the wallet. So now you get a new wallet with the block included inside it. Similarly, new pending takes a transaction and a wallet, and then returns a new wallet with the transaction put inside it. Right. Similarly, the total balance available balance will take a wallet and give you back the coin as the output the coin, which is the value of how much money is inside it. All right, so now we're going to define more functions. Just like I said, the, the start of the presentation is uh, mostly definitions, so that you can bear through it. Uh, first of all, is a function uh, that gives you the inputs for transactions. Right, so given a arbitrary set of transactions, uh, we want to give back an uh, arbitrary set of uh, transaction inputs. Right, uh, so remember transactions were a pair of inputs and outputs. So, okay, so every pair input output in a transaction, we just ignore the output. That's what this underscore means. Just like forget the output, uh, take the inputs in it and then union them all together. Right, so hopefully that should be pretty simple. Uh, transaction outputs takes a set of transactions again and then gives you back uh, the UTXO for it. All right, so this one is like a slightly more complicated. Uh, so, okay, so we have uh, set of transactions as an input to this function. Uh, okay, so we look at all the transactions inside uh, the set of transactions. And again, we filter out to the outputs. And remember, uh, the outputs were some mapping of indexed transaction outputs. Okay, so you imagine like uh, we have some set of transactions and we say, okay, transaction one goes to here and transaction two goes to here, transaction three goes to here, right? And then now that we have this, we can use uh, our uh, helper function to find earlier transaction ID to get the ID for this uh, transaction. Uh, and then the index uh, itself uh, from over here. And we map this to a transaction out, uh, which if you remember from previous definition, uh, was the address coin pair, right? And this, uh, if you look at the type, this actually ends up being the same type as a uh, UTXO. So essentially the transaction outs function, uh, if you think about it, it, you take a set of transactions and you give back as an output uh, the UTXO uh, for this transaction. Next up is balance, right? So balance is a simple function. You give it a UTXO and it gives you back the coin value, right? So you remember what's a UTXO? UTXO is just a uh, transaction to a pair of address and coin, right? And we just sum over all the coins in this UTXO, right? So this is fairly simple. Uh, but remember that uh, we could have theoretically uh, dependent transactions, right? So you can imagine I send money to uh, Alice and then, uh, for example, if I, if I have, uh, this, is, this is related to the UTXO model. But so imagine I have a UTXO with like a five BTC in it, right? And I send uh, three BTC to Alice. Right, so I would send three BTC to Alice. Uh, the way the UTXO model works is whenever you send money, you don't actually only send the three, 
you actually send the whole 5 BTC in the UTXO. And then you have uh, this block of U 2 to BTC. And uh, you actually send this back to yourself if you think about it. So whenever I want to send uh, 3, I have to find a UTXO that, in a sense, uh, sums up to greater than 3. Send 3 to somebody and then send the remaining to back to myself. And I say it back to myself, it's not actually sending it back to myself, I'm just sending it to addresses that I own. Right, so that's why you might have noticed, uh, if you look at an implementation of a wallet, if you send money, uh, it'll create a new address uh, that will belong to you. And that's where the uh, remainder of the money is sent to, right? So it's sent to your new address that also belongs to you. And uh, the way, the reason this is done is uh, this increases the privacy because now from an external point of view, uh, if somebody finds your wallet, they see that you sent three BTC to one address and two BTC to another address, and they're not sure uh, which address belongs to you and which address belongs to Alice. So it adds like this extra layer of anonymity to this. Okay. Uh, so what does this have to do with, with dependent transactions? Well, imagine I have only one UTXO with five BTC in it. And first I send three BTC to Alice, and then I send two BTC to Bob. Well, actually the second uh, transaction I'm doing where I'm sending two BTC to Bob, uh, it depends on this first transaction uh, going through, right? Uh, because I'm sending from this uh, thing over here, which only created after my original transaction. So, okay, so what does it mean for transactions to be dependent? Uh, well, I mean, transaction two depends on transaction one. If uh, transaction uh, one belongs to the uh, inputs of transaction two, right? So, uh, the reason we have an index is because if you see here, this is like index zero, index one, if you will, right? So say, okay, there's some index uh, in transaction one that's an input to my second transaction, or should be my transaction down here. Uh, so you can see because it's an input to my transaction going down here, uh, we can say that the transaction two is a, uh, depends on the success of transaction one. All right. Uh, and then we can do the same thing with a uh, set of transactions, uh, but this is just an extension of uh, dependency on individual transactions. Okay, so what are the properties of balance? I think these are also fairly obvious. If you have a balance of a set of UTXO U plus a set of UTXO V, or actually the union of both of them, as long as they're independent, then you can just add these up. Uh, so this would be fairly straightforward. Uh, the one that requires like a tiny bit more thought is, uh, okay, so if you have a UTXO U and you remove a set of inputs, it's the same thing as if you took the balance of all of U minus whatever you took out. Uh, where what you took out is essentially uh, UTXO U, uh, which had these as inputs, right? So essentially like uh, when you take the balance of this whole thing, uh, what did you take out uh, from the total balance? Well, you took out the uh, set that was removed uh, from the UTXO. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so now we have to figure out how we want to update the UTXO whenever a uh, new block comes in. Okay, so we need to have some sort of func function called update UTXO. And whenever a new block comes into the blockchain, uh, we have to update our UTXO because it's possible somebody spent money and it's no longer an unspent transaction. Remember, UTXO is unspent transaction output. So if we apply a block, it's possible somebody spent the money and therefore it is no longer uh, part of the UTXO. And it's also possible that we have to add to the UTXO, right? Because imagine I had a previous UTXO Right, this is a pre UTXO in the previous blockchain. And then we add a block which now spends this money here. And then also like uh, send some change back to myself. 
Uh, I mean, now these are both UTXOs, right? Because they haven't been spent yet. Uh, and so we have to remove this thing from the UTXO and add these two things to the UTXO. And so you can imagine uh, this is for a single transaction. For a block, you may have to do multiple inputs uh, along with, uh, or sorry, say multiple additions along with multiple like uh, subtractions, right? So it's tempting to uh, consider these adding to the UTXO and removing from the UTXO as uh, independent operations, right? So you would say, okay, what do we add? Okay, will we add, uh, sorry, okay, so we remove uh, any UTXO that was uh, uh, input in this block, right? So similarly, like because this uh, UTXO here is used as an input in this block, we want to get rid of it, right? So this is the part right here. And then we also want to uh, union in uh, all the transaction outs that belong to us uh, with transaction outs are part of the block. So the reason we do it this way is because uh, from a wallet point of view, right, this is our wallet, right? So we only care about the UTXO uh, that belongs to us, right? If this UTXO up here belongs to Alice, I don't need to keep track of this uh, for my wallets, right? The actual full node will need to keep track of all the information. But for me, as just a wallet user, I only care about the UTXO that belongs to me. Why? Because my balance uh, only depends on my UTXO, right? So throughout this entire uh, document, we assume that uh, we have another program that's like a full node that verifies transactions are correct. Right, and anything uh, there is that's bad is thrown out. And then we, as the wallet implementation, assume everything is legal. We assume all the checks passed and whatever. And so at the uh, wallet layer, uh, we only care about the UTXOs that belong to us. Right, and that's why we filter uh, to transactions that belong to us, because all we care about is this chain address, because that's the only one that actually changes our final balance, right? So what do we care about? Well, we look at all the outputs uh, from our block and we filter down to all the ones that uh, correspond to an address that belongs to us, okay? And then, so uh, this, this the reason that this uh, setup up here doesn't work, where you consider the additions and subtractions uh, individually and add them together is because as I mentioned earlier, it's possible we have a dependency, right? So it's possible in the same block, uh, we have this transaction here and we have another transaction as I showed earlier that also spends this again, right? And if you did this kind of naive model over here, uh, you know, you would end up removing this and removing this, but in this part over here, you would end up adding this back in along with adding this. Uh, but you you would di you didn't want to include this one up here because it's already spent, right? So you you'd end up overcounting, and so that's why we need to actually chain these together into one large calculation, which is okay. First, okay, so let's redraw this picture because the one up here is getting kind of ugly, right? So we have this chain of dependencies in our block, right? So this is our original UTXO. And say, okay, so which ones are outputs in our block that belong to us? Well, this one's an output in our block that belongs to us, right? This is our change after we sent to Alice. And this one also belongs to us because this is our change after sending to Bob, right? So this uh, set over here represents these two transactions here, all right? But now we want to remove uh, transactions that were also used as an input to the block, right? And which one's used as an input? This one's used as an input, right? So we would end up removing this, and our final result is only this new UTXO down here, and that's the desired result, right? So this is uh, our new block. So a new UTXO that was added as a result of applying this block, right? So you can imagine the total result would be something like a previous UTXO uh, 
union with new B, something like that, right? So this is what we'll see in the future. Uh, but th this function over here will just give us uh, the the new thing added uh, in the block uh, by by applying this block. Uh, and if you're wondering of the proof, I mean, I just showed you guys kind of what it looks like. Uh, but you can see the proof in mathematical notation right here. All right, and so moving on, uh, we also need to update the pending set. Remember, because our wallet had two things we cared about. One is updating the UTX every block, and also updating the pending set, which is whenever I send money through my wallet, I need to keep track of which paying transactions uh, that I'm waiting to be included in the blockchain. Okay. So what uh, does a new pending look like? Uh, we'll see that uh, right here. I think actually, yeah. So what is a new pending? Uh, whenever you add a transaction to a set of UTXO and existing pending, you just add in, right, this uh, transaction to the set of uh, pending transactions. So it should make sense that if you have a list of pending transactions and you want to create a new pending transaction, you just add it to the existing list. Uh, so this is a fairly uh, simple function, right? So now what is apply block? Well, apply block is just updating the UTXO followed by updating the pending. So whenever you see a new block in the blockchain, you update your pending, you update your UTXO, and you're done. All right. So now what does the wallet state look like? Uh, well, now we, we have our formal definition uh, for now, which is our, our wallet is just a UTXO along with a set of pending. All right. And then whenever we create a new wallet, uh, we have no UTXO, right? Because when you create a new wallet, it's empty. And we also have no pending, right? This is the empty set. We have no pending because we haven't uh, actually sent anything yet. All right. So uh, now we've come to these balance functions that uh, we uh, briefly touched on earlier in the video. So uh, to describe what these are, we first have to define some auxiliary functions. Right. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have uh, available, right? So what is available? The available just takes the uh, set of UTXO and removes any pending transactions, right? Because uh, even though a p transaction is pending, you should assume it goes through, right? And so whenever you send a transaction, even though it's still pending, it should remove from your balance, right? So from the UI's perspective, when you send transaction, you'll see in your wallet UI, the amount of, uh, of coins left in your account will go down instantly, right? And then we need to still figure out how much uh, we get after this uh, transaction goes through, right? And that's defined by this total function, right? So we define our uh, new balance after we send this transaction, uh, but we need to add back in the change, right? So you remember like uh, in our example previously, we had five BTC and we sent three BTC to Alice. Uh, and then we had to have a change of two BTC back to ourselves, right? So uh, whenever we do available, uh, we will remove these, this pending transaction uh, from our balance entirely, right? Uh, but for the total function, we will add back in this change. So instead of displaying zero as our wallet balance, we'll end up uh, showing two BTC as our wallet balance uh, because we're keeping in mind that we will get two BTC back uh, when this transaction is included in the blockchain. So that's kind of what this uh, change pending is. Uh, so we look at the transaction outs that belongs to ours. And uh, as long as the output is part of the pending, right, because this is our paying transaction over here, uh, then we just say this is part of our, our pending change. What we should come back after this uh, transaction is no longer pending is properly included in the blockchain. Right. 
And uh, for the update UTXO, this is what I was showing you guys earlier. So uh, you end up having the UTXO uh, unions uh, with everything from the new block. So you remember our new block function in the past was uh, all this thing with this UTXO stuff removed, this union or. But so if you if you remove this part, this is our, our new B. Right, and we union uh, the UTXO into this new B. So that's, that's what this part here does. Right, so we union that in. And then we have to remember to remove uh, any part uh, that was used up after we've unioned this in, right? So like if you if you took this union and you put it outside, like if you if you did the union here and then union it with the rest of new B, right? So if you did like a something like this, you would actually end up with the wrong result for the same reason we showed earlier, because you need to remove uh, these dependent transactions uh, after. Uh, the unit is already done. All right, and then update pending. Uh, fairly simple. You just add in. Uh, so you take a block set of pending transactions, and you add all the pending transactions from block to your set of pending transactions. Uh, and so it's fairly simple. Uh, you go over every transaction uh, that is pending. Uh, where you, you add in every uh, input from uh, your transactions. And the only uh, additional requirement is uh, this thing over here, which says uh, if it's part of a block, right? So if this uh, pending transaction is now part of block, then we need to remove it from our pending set, right? Because it's no longer pending if it's now part of block and put it into the blockchain, right? So we say uh, for every transaction we have, for every inputs we have, if they have been used inside the uh, a block, so they're now part of the blockchain, uh, just remove them from the set of pending transactions. So hopefully that makes sense. And that's kind of our... Uh, a basic wallet and uh, from here on out what we're trying to do is now that we have our basic wallets we want to add on top of it uh, some extra features uh, to make it faster so why do we need to make it faster so that's what we're gonna uh, see right here if there's th these are some invariants uh, but I think they're all fairly uh, simple if you think about it uh, so what what are uh, why do we need to make it faster so here we show the running time of various uh, operations. Uh, so how long? So this means how long, in the worst case, does it take to do something? So if you're not familiar with a big old transaction, this is like a programming notation. It says, "What's the worst case uh, running time of an algorithm?" All right. So to understand uh, these up here, uh, you first need uh, this result down here, uh, which is to say, okay, how do we store the UTXO? And the decision is to store the UTXO as a balanced uh, binary tree, right? And this is useful because imagine you need to find the UTXO, right? Remember our previous example, we were trying to send uh, three BTT to Alice. You need to find a UTXO that is larger than three or a set of UTXO that are larger than three. And so to make these kind of searches in the set of UTXO, it's nice to have it sorted uh, by the amount, sorry, by the amount uh, that the UTXO owns uh, that we can do the search efficiently. And you also want it to be a uh, balanced tree that way you make sure you don't run into a worst case scenario uh, where your tree ends up having a O of N uh, search time. Right, so you want that whenever uh, you make a search and your UTXO for a specific transaction, uh, it should be uh, log N time uh, where N is the size of your UTXO.
right? And similarly, you would do the same thing with any inputs and outputs to transaction. You try and just represent everything as a balanced binary tree. Okay. And so now that we have uh, this design, uh, the question is how do we officially do the uh, union and uh, subsets and all these kinds of transactions, or not transactions, operations we were trying to do earlier. And actually there's a paper uh, that shows that if you want to take the union of two balanced binary trees uh, of M and N, uh, you end up getting uh, this runtime here. Right, and if you're wondering where this comes from, because this may seem kind of strange, it ends up being that it's like, uh, I forgot exactly, but something like log base two of like uh, choose M, choose like N from M plus N, something like that. Uh, and then if you like uh, rewrite this and it ends up being something like this. And the reason that it was like log base two of this like a uh, choose operation was because they were saying, okay, you have like a two arrays which represent your trees. And then to merge them together, you have one larger array. And so uh, you're essentially trying to insert elements from uh, the smaller array into the bigger array. Uh, so if you have n plus n positions and your larger array, uh, you need to choose n of them, right? Because this is a small array, and you need to choose like n places to put these elements in, uh, you know, something like that. And it ends up uh, uh, to do this, you need to have some sort of like a algorithm that supports uh, uh, multi-threading, right? Where you end up. Uh, with the parallelism factor being uh, n, so you need as, as many threads, in a sense, as uh, the smaller array. And if you have all that sorted out, then you can use an algorithm that, uh, created to end up getting this runtime. Uh, so you, you can look up this paper. If you want to find it yourself, uh, find up the, look up the formal specification document. And here we're at page 11. Uh, but if you go all the way to the very last page, you'll see in the references uh, the actual presentation where they show this. But this is, this is not too important for the work we're doing here. But I just want to motivate that uh, this this is where this runtime comes from. All right. So let's look at some of the runtimes, and uh, hopefully now that we have this knowledge, uh, everything should be fairly straightforward, right? So what is the balance of a UTXO, for example? Well, remember previously we said the balance of a UTXO is just the sum of all the coins in it. You know, therefore it's linear in the size of the UTXO. Uh, remember that uh, when we were trying to find the transaction inputs, we were trying to find uh, uh, over all the inputs. It may be easier if we pull it back up. Actually, it's pretty far back. Maybe this is a mistake to pull it back up to re refresh you guys in the meaning. Uh, but it's too late now. Actually, I think it skipped it. Right. So remember for the transaction inputs, we went over a lot of transactions and we uh, did this union operation uh, and we ended up, uh, due to our decision of using these uh, balanced binary trees, uh, adding adding into uh, adding an element to a balanced binary tree is just a uh, log and running time. And this is why, uh, whenever you add single elements uh, to the data structure, uh, you end up getting this n log n. Uh, running time because uh, the addition in, the addition into the structure is log n time and you have to do n additions uh, where in this case n is represented by transactions uh, txn, txs uh, and that's where you get this n log n from. It's from a repeated addition into this uh, binary tree. Right. So hopefully uh, now that we uh, I understand these two concepts, where these joins come from, 
and where these end login notations come from. Uh, then these more complicated notations of concepts like what is the available balance start to make more sense, right? Uh, because remember, uh, the balance is, uh, so remember available balance is like a balance, it's the composition of balance and available. Right, so if you don't know this, like a circle notation here means composition of functions. Right, so first we have to calculate available and we calculate balance, which is why we get a plus because it's one function after another. Right, and remember from up here we have available is the joint of the transaction inputs and the UTXO. Right, if you're wondering why uh, we're doing join despite the fact we're actually subtracting, right? Because remember the available function, we took our UTXO and uh, we removed inputs, right, from the pending transactions, right? Well, it turns out uh, that joining two trees such that you add things to it uh, has the same runtime as taking one tree and removing all elements uh, that belong to another tree. Uh, so they end up uh, both being represented by uh, the same right time. Therefore, in the paper, they decide to only have uh, one word for it, which is called join, but it's kind of misleading because it could be uh, adding one tree to another, or it could be uh, subtracting one tree from the other. So this is where this join comes from. And once we have the join, we finish the join, then we calculate the balance on top of it, right? And we have something similar for like total balance. And hopefully all this kind of makes sense. Uh, so what's wrong with this, right? Uh, it's, this is not mathematically wrong, right? But the problem is that uh, this is fairly slow, right? Uh, let's just say if you want to sum over all the UTXO, uh, if you are a regular user, right? And you've, you've had, you know, maybe five, 10 transactions in your lifetime, maybe a few hundred transactions in your lifetime, uh, this is not that big of a deal, right? Uh, however, if you're an exchange and you process, you know, hundreds of thousands of these uh, per day, uh, creating UT UTXO every time, uh, then all these operations start becoming much slower, right? So our biggest priority is trying to help, for example, the exchanges uh, being able to calculate uh, their current balance faster, because uh, this gives us a uh, better experience uh, for all the customers, right? And so to do that, we, we need to introduce some sort of caching mechanism, okay? So we're gonna try and cache the UTXO, that way we don't have to recalculate every time. Uh, and so to do that first, uh, they have a few lemmas, and uh, hopefully this should uh, seem familiar, right? Remember before we had the lemma where like a balance was like a, what do we have? We had like some sort of like a, uh, with a triangle UTXO was equal to the balance of the whole UTXO minus, uh, sorry, this would be a slash. So minus whatever is part of A. Right, this is like the avail the same lemma, right? So this is why it says like a 2.6.1. This is the same thing, except now uh, we're doing this uh, with pendings, right? So the available balance of UTXO and pending is the balance of the whole UTXO minus uh, whatever is part of the pending transactions, right? And we have a similar uh, lemma for total balance. And uh, because uh, the balance uh, takes so long, uh, this ends up uh, being fairly expensive. So we want to uh, cache the balance, uh, but to do that, we're gonna have to first introduce uh, some new notation. All right, so to do this caching, we're gonna introduce a new variable uh, right here. So this new variable uh, will basically represent the cached uh, balance for our account. Uh, 
right? And then, so now whenever we apply the block, uh, we need to update this cached value to get this uh, new version, uh, which contains our updated balance. And so what is this new version? Uh, it's just the balance of the new UTXO, right? Uh, so how are we going to update uh, our cached balance uh, efficiently? Well, if you think back uh, at our UTXO definition, right, this is uh, how we update our UTXO. Uh, this part over here uh, represents solely what we add in, right, uh, from our block. So this is purely adding in stuff. Remember, because this part was like the removing stuff, and this part is purely adding in stuff, okay? So what if we extract this out uh, to its own variable? So we have UTXO plus, uh, which represents uh, all these new trans, uh, all these new UTXOs uh, that we're adding in. Okay, and then now our uh, new updated uh, balance is the application application of the function balance over uh, the new UTXO, right? So we take this, we represent this by UTXO plus, and then now this is our. Uh, new function for our new balance, right? So, all right, nothing special so far. We've just rewritten part of the function. Okay, but now uh, remember that we said that we can actually uh, distribute the balance function, right? So remember that whenever we had balance with this uh, exclusion term over here, we could actually represent the balance as uh, the balance of the right part, right hand part, uh, minus whatever we took out on the left hand part of this uh, exclusion operator. Right. All right. So now we expand this out, uh, and remember from our previous uh, uh, definition of balance, uh, we can actually uh, factor out this part also, right? Because we have a union here. And because here we're solely adding in new parts, right? We're not removing anything. Uh, UTXO and UTXO plus are actually uh, independent parts, right? And so we can uh, separate these out to balance UTXO plus, balance UTXO plus, right? And then the subtraction part stays exactly the same. Okay, but now notice that this part right here, this balance UTXO, uh, this is our cached part right here. And so all we need to do to update our cached value is calculate this balance UTXO plus uh, followed by this uh, balance removal over here. And it turns out, as you can see here, uh, these are fairly uh, cheap operations. And so we can eff uh, effectively cache our balance and also update it. All right, so what does this look like overall? So now we have our new uh, basic wallet where now we've added this cash balance, right? So you can see the available balance function changes such that now we add this uh, cash, uh, the total balance because it calls available balance reuses this cash. And then this apply block function down here uh, uses the cache and updates it uh, with the data of the new block, right? And then for our wallet itself, uh, we have to add this cache to the wallet, which is just a coin. And whenever you create a new wallet, this initializes to zero, right? So now that we have this, uh, how do we make it even better? Okay, well, if you look at uh, the definition of apply block, uh, which is our new definition, you might notice that uh, transaction out only occurs once, right? And it only occurs once in this uh, UTXO plus function over here, right? Everything else that happens uh, is either based off this cash balance or the transaction ends of B. Okay, so what if we tried to uh, what they call pre-filter uh, on the supply block? That is, what if instead of uh, whenever we call the supply, apply block function, uh, 
instead of calling with the entire block as an argument, we try and remove some stuff early on that we know won't be needed uh, to make this function more efficient. Right, and this is what this uh, pre-filtering uh, is. Okay, so with pre-filtering, uh, we will end up uh, only trying to call apply block uh, using the transaction in of B along with the UTXO plus. Right, and so now the question is, can we do even better? Uh, except, I mean, we haven't really uh, excluded anything here uh, because to calculate this UTXO plus, uh, we still need uh, to go over the entire block, right, to find all the transaction outs, right? So can we uh, somehow limit this transaction in B uh, even more? Uh, that way we, we uh, pass even less data to this function. And it turns out, uh, if you take tax, uh, transaction in B and you uh, end up filtering to this uh, specific subset, uh, which is uh, which is the intersection of the transaction inputs of the block, uh, along with the uh, domain and remember the domain is the inputs of our uh, previous UTXO union with uh, the UTXO plus. Okay, so suppose we, we perform this intersection. Uh, we want to show, do we actually lose anything that matters to us, right? And how do we show that? Uh, well, remember inside uh, our apply block, we have these uh, three calculations uh, that we're using the block information. And we want to show that in all three cases, uh, calling these functions with transaction in B uh, gives us the same result as calling the function with transactions in B uh, intersected uh, with this thing over here, right? And it turns out that actually this is true, right? So if you think about uh, the UTXO minus, right? Uh, so actually, I think I missed the definition of UTXO minus when I was uh, going on the first part. Uh, but it's it's a uh, fairly simple. It's just the remaining part of uh, the UTXO plus. Actually, I don't, I don't even, yeah, yeah. So they, I think they just mentioned. I'm not sure if there's even a formula uh, where they say they're defining UTXO minus. Uh, which gives us uh, the the removal part of our apply block function. Uh, so now that we have the UTXO minus, also, okay, yeah, so here it is, yeah, UTXO minus. Uh, UTXO minus uh, takes, you know, what we added in and remove the transactions in B, right? Okay, so, and this is where we, we got the UTXO minus from, right? So remember, this is UTXO minus, right? And uh, we remove anything uh, that comes in the left-hand side, right? That's our, our definition of our uh, exclusion operator. And uh, because we're uh, limiting it, limiting our transactions B to this right here, uh, we're actually not losing anything that matters, right? Because we can only uh, exclude from this set over here, anything that's part of this set. Uh, so if anything is not part of this intersection, it would not have been removed from this set anyways. Right, hopefully that makes sense. And uh, similarly, uh, for all the other ones, if you think about it, uh, you also can't uh, do anything with this set if it's not part of this set also. So it's fine if we, uh, restrict the transactions B. And then similarly for the pending transactions, uh, we get uh, something similar. And so you, you can think about it more if you want, uh, but the just the matter is uh, we can actually limit uh, transactions in B before calling the apply block function uh, to ensure we pass in less data. And so that's our next optimization.
And that's how we end up with this new wallet for pre-filtering, uh, where the wallet stays the same as our, our cash balance state. Uh, but now our apply block function is replaced uh, with this new function that takes two arguments, the UTXO plus, along with this uh, filtered version of the transaction ends. Uh, and also note that now we only calculate UTXO plus once, and then we'll reuse it uh, down here twice. So we get some sort of efficiency uh, from this calculation also. So all right, so now we made this faster. What's another problem we have to ca uh, tackle, right? Well, the next problem is this problem of rollbacks. Okay, so what is a rollback? So you can imagine whenever you start adding stuff to the blockchain, uh, it's possible that a new longer chain comes up, right? So when a new longer chain comes up, uh, you have to undo progress and redo progress on the new chain, right? So imagine you have your, your chain down here, you're going down the chain, uh, full in blocks, and suddenly like uh, your client is made aware that there's a new longer chain over here. And so you need to like uh, roll back, which is go back here, go back here, switch the new chain, and then go down the new chain, right? Uh, so we need to undo any uh, states that happened in this part right here, and this is what we call the rollback. What makes this even more complicated is that imagine that you sent a uh, transaction uh, somewhere over here, right? Uh, well, your transaction got rolled back. So whenever you come back here on the new chain, you may have to resend your transaction uh, in order for it to be included in the new longer chain. Right, so this is uh, the fundamental problem. And the way we support uh, being able to roll back is with the concept of checkpoints, right? So now if you look at our wallet, we have a set of checkpoints. And what is a checkpoint? Uh, so so just for simplicity, uh, the rollback uh, problem is independent from the problems we saw earlier, which is the uh, caching and the pre-filtering. So uh, when we look at this figure, we pretend the pre-filtering and the uh, caching, just we never talked about it, just to make uh, this uh, thing over here, this model simpler, right? So remember our, our original wallet was UTXO impending. So now our set of checkpoints is now a list, right? This is a list. It's a list of UTXO impending, right? And so you can imagine every time we add a block, every block will be its own checkpoint. So we add a new element to this list. And that's exactly what we're doing here, right? This uh, two dot operator here, this is a concatenation. It's how you concatenate lists in Haskell. So whenever you apply a block, you attach uh, to the head of the list, uh, this new state of the new UTXO and the new pending. Right, and now uh, every other operation uh, also keeps track of history in this checkpoints list, right? So the new pending will also attach a new element to the head of this list. Uh, if you're wondering why we're adding to the head, by the way, instead of adding to the tail, this is just like an implementation detail of Haskell. Uh, implementing uh, to the head is O of one, Implement, uh, adding to the tail is O of n. And this is because a Haskell will use like a singly linked list in this direction. Or sorry, I should say uh, the, the, the head pointer is here, right? So whenever you access a list, uh, you only have access to the first element and to uh, access the last element, if you want to add to the end, you'd have to follow this chain of uh, links in your link list. Uh, all the way to the end, so it would be like a uh, O of N. So that's why we're adding to the head. Right, and then now we need this rollback function uh, and essentially just popped off from the list, right? So imagine we have a chain of checkpoints, right? So this is where we are currently. This is one block back, and this is the rest of the list. Uh, we just uh, remove the head, and now we're left uh, with the uh, previous state that was one block back 
but there's one slight thing we have to do is, as I mentioned before, we have to add back in uh, all the pending transactions, right? So if we made a transaction, like a pending transaction over here, we have to add it back in uh, to the pending set to make sure that we correctly send it as part of our new chain. So uh, it, it should be fairly straightforward that if you uh, apply a block followed by roll back the block is the same thing as identity, that is you didn't do anything. Uh, and then if you apply a block, create a new transaction, and then roll back, uh, these two cancel out, and so you're left with just creating a new transaction. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, as we roll back blocks, uh, these pending transactions uh, don't start conflicting with each other. And uh, this is uh, fairly straightforward in the case uh, where we have a single client, right? Because uh, of our, the way we defined uh, transactions uh, previously, uh, we had some invariants that said, okay, uh, if you create a uh, one block, with some paying transactions, then another block, some paying transactions uh, that depend on the other one, uh, then they cannot have the same inputs. Uh, and this just makes sense uh, from a blockchain perspective, right? You can't use the same uh, input twice and still have it be a ballot block, right? So this is just saying that uh, if you have uh, these two blocks part of pending, uh, that became uh, union together, right? Because remember, as we uh, roll back the chain, we like add in these pending uh, transactions, right? So remember before we may have like a transaction one that's uh, dependent, or sorry, transaction two that's dependent on transaction one, right? And it, it, it could be okay uh, if they, they remain chained together this way and we say uh, basically we're trying to say even in the case of rollbacks uh, chains that were properly dependency chains that are properly set up are still properly set up uh, so that's kind of what this is talking about and this I think this is pretty straightforward uh, one of the bigger problems is whenever we add these checkpoints, uh, we take more memory on our computer, right? And so if you imagine if we take every checkpoint for the entire blockchain, then we start taking way too much memory. Uh, and so to solve this, uh, I should say solve as like, to minimize this problem, uh, we only keep uh, 2,160 uh, checkpoints, right? That means our client could only ever roll back up to 2,160 blocks, or I should say slots in this case, uh, for Cardano. And then if there's ever a new longer chain that requires you to roll back more than 2,160 slots, uh, then you, your client will just not be able to handle it. You would have to like close your client and then like uh, resync the chain in, like possibly delete your old chain and then like a re-download from Genesis or something like that. Uh, but this is like a, you remember every slot in Cardano is 20 seconds. So if you've somehow been stuck on like a chain for like uh, a very long time, uh, this is like a very unlikely. And so uh, it kind of makes sense that in these kinds of rare situations, you would have to manually decide if you want to uh, stay on this new fork chain or rejoin uh, the main longer chain. So that's kind of uh, what's happening here and this is a problem. And the problem is mostly just like a memory problem We're trying to minimize the amount of memory it's used. If you don't know, every block in Cardano is currently set as a maximum of two megabytes. Uh, and so the, the argument that goes on here is that uh, the amount of memory that's used 
uh, is not too much. It should be uh, enough to be handled by a desktop client. Uh, brief discussion here is uh, trying to create a function called switch that uh, encapsulates both rolling back and applying the new blocks together. So as I say, if you had like a two chains, you would roll back and then apply and this would all be one function. Uh, but uh, it ends up that these are two separate functions and you don't really get a benefit uh, from implementing it as like a one switch function. So that's their uh, discussion of rollbacks. And uh, this will uh, kind of pollute all our thoughts going forward in the sense that no, no matter what we're doing going forward, we have to take into account the fact that it may be disastrously roll back and we have to like uh, reapply on a new chain. So now we're getting to a uh, new section, uh, kind of independent from everything else, which is called uh, minimum balance. Right, and the idea is we want to figure out uh, for our client what is the minimum balance we could possibly have. So you, uh, the way we define the minimum balance is uh, whenever we send a set of pending transactions, it's possible that some of them fail, right? Uh, maybe do some networking issue or whatever, uh, one of the pending transactions fails, but the others go through. Similarly, uh, we also have a concept of expected transactions. So what is an expected transaction? Well, expected transaction is a transaction that happens like uh, in this part of like uh, a chain, right? And then remember when we rolled back, we're back over here and we kind of expect that these transactions will reoccur in this uh, new future, uh, which is our new longer chain. Right, so we kind of expect, for example, if like a Alice sent us money here, or if we sent money back to ourselves through some change, uh, we expect the same thing to happen in this newer chain. And so it's kind of like an expected uh, profit, if you will, or expected transaction. And so we have these two uh, concepts where the penny transactions may or may not finalize due to network problems. And similarly, uh, these expected uh, transactions may or may not come back depending on uh, what happened in this longer chain. And if the other clients we were uh, communicating with on this other chain, uh, if they also do switch, and if after they switch, they do in fact resend the transactions. Right, so we're not sure exactly what may happen. So because of this uncertainty, we would like to know, okay, what is our minimum balance? How much do we know we must have at least this much, right? And this is the problem we're trying to solve. And so uh, to do this, we now have a model with rollbacks and expected UTXO, okay? Because uh, remember, uh, because our balance is derived solely from the UTXO, uh, our minimum balance uh, can be calculated from this like expected UTXO, uh, which now joins our wallet state, right? And then uh, now all our functions must also take into account this expected uh, transactions, right? And it's like I said, uh, whenever you roll back, uh, you would have to union in together uh, the uh, expected transactions from your previous block and you also add into your expected uh, all the uh, transactions that were removed basically right it is okay we remove them from this chain uh, and they're expected because we're gonna be adding them back uh, to this new chain right so just remember this UTX over here uh, comes from our latest block and so we take from our latest block and we remove everything from our earliest block right so this gives us like the difference between these two right so this would be like the difference in the UTXO here and we add this in uh, to our expected right and that's how we get like our update expected also 
uh, where we take our expected, right? So remember, like as we're uh, going through this way, as we're reapplying the blocks, we need to remove stuff from the expected, right? Because okay, we we were, we added to the expected here, and like okay, we actually got what we expected. We got what we expected, right? So as we call this update expected function, we take our expected UTXO and we remove in everything we saw from the new blocks over here, right? And that's why for our apply block function, we now call in this expected B. Okay, and I think all of this is not that important. Uh, the only important stuff comes, yeah, I think down here. Okay, so that's to say, uh, now we're, we're gonna get to the calculation of the minimum balance, right? And to calculate the minimum balance, we want to find the minimum balance across all possible futures, right? So like I said, all possible ways, the pending transactions or the expected transactions could come in. Right, and this is where we come to our old friend, uh, the square included, right? And the reason we need the square included as opposed to the strict uh, subset uh, function is because uh, Whenever we include from the ex expected, uh, we don't only uh, bring in what we were thinking of, we also bring in the entire uh, block uh, as we apply the new chain, if that makes sense. Uh, so we need to make sure everything we thought was ex ex uh, expected uh, does come in, and so it is a subset, uh, but it also includes like a bunch of other transactions and whatever, and so it includes uh, a transaction level uh, as opposed to an input level. Like this entire transaction here uh, must come, you know, somewhere over here, and this entire transaction here must come somewhere up here, right? So we need to make sure uh, not just the individual inputs and outputs, uh, but the whole transaction uh, comes in. Uh, in these expected blocks as we switch to the new chain, right? So, okay, so whenever we calculate the minimum balance, uh, we kind of build up this list, right? So I think this uh, notation here is the one that is the most visually uh, easy, visually easy to understand, which is to say, okay, we have one way to calculate the total balance uh, for given expected and given pending, right? And okay, for a different expected, different uh, pending, we have this other possible balance. And for yet another expected and pending, we have this other balance. And we're trying to take the minimum overall possible balances. Right. And this ends up uh, being bounded in this uh, following way. Right. So we say, okay, uh, available balance is smaller than minimum balance, which is smaller than total balance, which is smaller than balance uh, overall. Okay, so let's try and kind of like a break this down and see why all of these hold. All right, so I think the easiest to talk about first is this inequality right here. This balance is uh, larger than total balance. And this makes sense because if you remember, balance just summed up the entire UTXO without removing anything at all, right? Whereas these three right here, they all remove uh, the pending transactions, right? So if balance uh, does not remove the pending transactions, uh, all of which uh, spend money, uh, then balance should be the largest of all of them. Okay. Uh, next up, we have, uh, you know, these two over here. Uh, and so this makes sense because if you remember the definition of available balance, uh, you might remember that we were taking away the change, right? So we were taking our balance, uh, our balance minus uh, pending, right? And remember, uh, total balance was adding the change back. Right, and because of 
the way we define minimum balance, essentially what we're trying to figure out is what is the minimum change that could possibly come back, right? And so any amount of change that can come back is better than no change at all, which is what available balance represents, right? And the reason minimum balance is uh, smaller or equal to total balance is because uh, if you think about it, if we receive everything uh, that we expect to get, uh, then that's what we get with this total balance function right here. Right, and uh, this entire list would uh, collapse down onto a single element. Uh, and this would be like the maximum and the only element in this list, right? So, uh, if you think about it, uh, the total balance uh, must be uh, larger than the minimum balance uh, because we define the minimum balance as uh, some subset right, of the total balance. And when I say some subset, I mean some sub -sub subset of the change. Instead of getting all the change back, uh, we will only get part of the change back in some way, shape, or form. And so that's why the minimum balance uh, must be smaller than the total balance. Okay, and hopefully this makes sense also. So now we want to essentially, uh, okay, so first we have a discussion over here about why we do expected UTXO versus expected transactions. Uh, so I can touch on that briefly. Basically, it's, it's really simple. Uh, remember we're in our wallet state, we keep track of the expected UTXO instead of keep track of the expected transactions, right? Because you might say like, okay, instead of keeping track of the UTXO, you might say like, okay, expect this transaction, expect this transaction, expect this transaction, and then check the transactions that go through. Uh, the problem is to check transactions, uh, you would essentially need to also make sure all the dependencies are correct, right? So you can imagine maybe like a T2 here, it depends on T1 here, oops, T1. And so as you reapply them down this chain, you would need to make sure like a T1 comes first and then T2 comes first, right? Uh, but it's possible that T1 is not, uh, something related to you, right? This is like a Alice saying to Bob, and then Bob like does something that's related to you, right? And so to be able to check in this new chain that these dependencies occurred properly uh, would essentially mean that you need to keep track of the whole blockchain as opposed to only the part of the blockchain that matters to you. And so we were uh, specifically trying to avoid this. So all right, back to uh, calculating the minimum balance and how long it would take. Okay, so essentially what we'll do uh, to figure this out is like I said, we don't know uh, how much of the expected will actually happen, right? So let's just say we pick a, a, a uh, way, a possible future, right? So imagine like if we have expected one, expected two, expected three, like uh, we don't know which expected UTXO will actually happen uh, as we uh, go to the new longer chain. Uh, but let's say uh, we decide that expected one, expected two will be the one that's happen and expected three will not happen. Okay, so for a fixed set of that, then we say, okay, so how long would it take to calculate this minimum balance for this uh, fixed uh, expected set that we decided. It ends up being that this will be uh, linear in the size of pending. Uh, and we'll show this later on. Uh, and this is essentially a topological sort, which is a known uh, algorithm for linear time. Okay. And so if uh, picking one way of setting the expected uh, UTXO will give us linear time and we have uh, an exponential way of receiving uh, these expected, right? Because you remember, this is like a set, right? We have a set of all possible like expected that comes in. And if you want to know how many uh, ways there are to include exclude things from the set, it's like a two to the uh, size of the set. 
right? Because like a, either you include this one or you don't. Either you include this one or you don't. Either you include this one or you don't. So you make a zero or a one. You have like a two choices for each item. So like a, you have two choices for the first one times two choices for the second one times two choices for the third one, right? And this ends up being like two to the size of the set. Uh, so this ends up being exponential, right? So you have an exponential number of possibilities, each of them being linear time, okay? And so that ends up being our most naive running time. Uh, so how will we set up this uh, topological sort, like I mentioned earlier, how will we uh, do this? Uh, this is what this graph, or sorry, this uh, figure here represents. So don't get too intimidated. I know there's a bunch going on, uh, but it's actually not very complicated. So imagine you have a single transaction uh, and you want to know uh, whether or not you should include it to minimize the balance, right? So remember, we're trying to minimize the balance. So you see this transaction come in and you're like, okay, should I include this in our minimum balance calculation or not? Well, if uh, this transaction one which represents a coin, right? The transaction represents a coin, or sorry, the UTXO represents a coin, if you will. Uh, if it's if it's a smaller than zero, that's to say we sent money to somebody, uh, then we should definitely include it because we're trying to minimize the balance and so anything that, that reduces our balance, uh, we want to include in our calculation. However, if this uh, gives us money, for example, it's a change address or something is, is sends money back to us, uh, then we don't want to include it, right? And this is what this hat means here, it means exclude or not. Right, we don't want to include this transaction because we're trying to find the minimum balance, uh, the minimum possible future, right? So, okay, so what if we have, oops, what if we have two transactions where transaction two depends on transaction one? What are the possible futures, right? Well, it's possible that uh, transaction one, sorry, this is a typo uh, over here, but like, this is possible that transaction one and transaction two both happen. This is one possible future. It's also possible as a future uh, that uh, transaction one uh, never arrives, but transaction two arrives. And it's also possible none of them arrive, right? These are the three possible futures, okay? And uh, depending on which future we pick, uh, the balance changes, right? So if we add transaction one and transaction two, uh, then we take C1 plus C2. Right, so the question is which one of these minimizes our balance, right? Well, if we assume that C1 is smaller than zero, that is we assume that the first transaction was us spending money, and that's why we have like a dependent transaction because we're, we're like a spending money we, we got back after the change address. Uh, then if C2 is also smaller than zero, then we should definitely pick both of them, right? Because that means that C1 plus C2 is a negative number and so this will help minimize our balance. However, if C2 is a positive number, for example, a change address, uh, where we got some money back, then we want to see is C1 plus C2 negative, right? So is the future where we sent both of them uh, better than the future where we sent nothing? Or should I, if I, by better I mean does it minimize our balance even more? If so, then we uh, take it and we add it to our minimum balance uh, calculation. Otherwise, we just take the zero case where we say, okay, the minimum futures where uh, both these transactions uh, never occur, uh, somehow they were lost as we did the rollback or something like that. Right. And similarly, the rest of these calculations, uh, they're all different cases, right? Say, okay, what if transaction four happens and like uh, transaction two plus transaction four is smaller than zero in all these cases. And in different cases, we get different sums, right? And, and this is actually uh, what this model represents. Uh, but what this ends up proving is that we can model this as a topological sort, right? We just take, you know, the bottom element. Now this has uh, uh, no dependencies, so now we can take the next one, then T1 has no dependencies, so now we can take this one. And this is the same thing as topological sort, right? And because topological sort, uh, 
is a known uh, linear algorithm, linear time algorithm, uh, then this whole thing ends up being linear time, right? And so that's what we say. Uh, the imbalance is exponential in the size of expected, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but later in the size of pending, right? So for any uh, fixed expected set, we get linear pending, and then we have an exponential number of expected sets. Uh, therefore, this is the whole running time. Uh, one observation is that we can do an optimization uh, based on uh, mutually exclusive groups, right? So you can imagine we have like a some set of pending transactions, uh, really, you know, these transactions all depend on uh, each other. And then we have another set of pending transactions uh, where th this is, this also could be included, uh, but they don't depend on each other, right? And so because these are two uh, independent problems, whether or not these transactions all occur and do in fact minimize the balance, it's independent from whether or not these transactions occur and whether or not they do in fact minimize the balance because uh, none of these transactions depend on each other, right? So, okay, so we can use, you know, tricky uh, multi-threaded algorithms uh, to reduce our running time uh, to essentially the size of the largest group, right? So we say, okay, G is the size of the largest group. And then our, si our running time for calculating uh, the minimum balance uh, will be proportional to the lar largest group. Uh, we say, okay, so the largest group has, you know, instead of 10 expected, the largest group maybe only has three expected. Uh, and then we, you know, do two to the three. These are all our possibilities of expected. And we calculate uh, based on this one. And that will be uh, the largest runtime of the entire minimum balance calculation. This is kind of an optimization we can do. Uh, in the worst case, this doesn't, this doesn't help us at all, right? Because it's possible that every single transaction is all dependent. So we wouldn't have these like two independent things. We'd just have like one monstrous uh, dependency chain, right? But in most cases, uh, these will be end up uh, having some independence to them. And then uh, we can shrink our rank time to the largest group. Uh, one other optimization uh, is that whenever we make a choice, uh, to include an expected transaction in a possible future, we no longer have to backtrack on that choice, right? And so what does it mean to backtrack on that choice? Let me say we uh, decide to include uh, expected one, right? So we have some expected transaction and we say, okay, if we include expected one, then we minimize our balance. Uh, the concept of backtracking would be like, okay, we, ma we make this so choice to include expected one, but later on the algorithm, we would realize, oh, actually include expected one was not a good idea. We can minimize even further if we exclude in, uh, expected one and instead do some other strategy, right? And we, what we're trying to prove is that if we decide at some point to include expected one, that we will never have to backtrack. We'll never have to like accidentally decide, oh, actually we didn't want to do this. We should do this instead. All right, and this is what this thing here is trying to prove. Okay, so uh, the proof is not too hard. Uh, the only thing is trying to understand what these graphs actually mean, or so these uh, visualizations, these Venn diagrams actually mean. So remember these uh, expected here, uh, we're considering them coins, right? So this is like a number, could be like zero, could be five, whatever. And uh, this Venn diagram here represents the uh, pending transactions, right? So like uh, this section over here represents all pending transactions that only depend on E1 uh, actually happening, right? And this uh, intersection here represents uh, any penny transaction that depends on E1, depends on E2, but does not depend on E3, right? And so we're creating a Venn diagram of penny transactions and what uh, they depend on, okay? And uh, you can read this proof if you will, if you want to by yourself. 
uh, it's not too complicated. Essentially what happens is a proof by contradiction. So you see, okay, imagine we have uh, this case here where we pick E1 e and imagine somehow we would end up having to backtrack because we find a, a more efficient configuration that does not include E1. We show that this ends up leading to a contradiction, uh, which means uh, there is no such case where backtracking would give us a more optimal solution. Uh, but hopefully now that you know how these Venn diagrams are, if you want to see this proof, uh, you can look up the paper, it shouldn't take too long to go through, and uh, it should make intuitive sense that whenever you decide to include uh, an expected transaction, uh, you will not have to backtrack. So all right, so now we're going to uh, next section, again, kind of unrelated to everything we've done so far, which is tracking metadata. So metadata is important uh, for the blockchain, for the functioning of our API, right? So we need to make sure our API uh, can return some information of interest, such as how deep is this block? Uh, is this a change address? All this kind of stuff. And also because it's possible that somebody may want to input metadata into the blockchain uh, for whatever bookkeeping purposes, right? So maybe like a some financial institution wants to include metadata in the blockchain. Uh, that way for auditing purposes in the future, you can say, like, oh, this was for this and this was for this and all this kind of stuff, right? So that's kind of the, the motivation for why we need uh, metadata. Uh, and we actually end up uh, creating two types of metadata. One is uh, transaction metadata, which is to say this metadata is solely related to this individual uh, transaction. And uh, if this is the case, it makes sense that a rollback does not change the transaction metadata, right? Because you can imagine, uh, remember with a rollback, uh, the, tr the transaction, if it occurs here and we like move it over here, uh, the transaction itself didn't change, right? And so this metadata itself should not have changed either, right? So the transaction metadata is this like a stateless uh, metadata that depends entirely on the contents of uh, the transaction itself. We also have uh, metadata for the blockchain, right? Uh, which may depend, like may change over time, right? Because you can imagine uh, something like a how many blocks deep are we? Uh, it can change uh, if you roll back and apply to a new chain, right? So this is why we have uh, the stateless metadata, data, data, metadata, and also the state uh, stateful metadata depends on the blockchain. So, okay, so what does this look like? Uh, oh, actually, they, they, show, they show this. The figures are not like a properly in order, which is common in tech. People just deal with it. This is like a mathematical paper, kind of pet peeve some people have. Uh, but uh, people like uh, have different thoughts about where to put the figures to make it more easily to read, easier to find, whatever. Uh, so this is our figure. This is unrelated to the metadata stuff. Uh, but this shows the full wallet uh, with the rollbacks, uh, which is why we have a list here, with the pre-filtering, uh, with the uh, caching, everything all put together. And this is what it looks like as one big implementation. So right, moving on to the metadata. All right, so here's the metadata stuff. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have some transaction metadata about transactions. And we have some block metadata about the blocks themselves. And uh, we also have some operator here, uh, which is a monoid to concatenate uh, blocks together. So if you don't know what a monoid is, just imagine it as an abstract uh, way to add stuff together. So you can imagine like uh, for strings, uh, plus is our monoid, right? It adds two strings together. So monoid uh, essentially captures this abstract notion of uh, concatenate, con either concatenation or combination of elements, right? And similarly, like a monoid on an empty element, for example, the empty string plus B will just give you back the uh, B itself. So our monoid will have some sort of identity element. Uh, so this is what they mean right here. So, okay, so uh, 
we have uh, transaction metadata, which takes a transaction and gives us the metadata for that transaction. And also a block metadata, because remember a block is a set of transactions. So we have a set of transactions and gives us back the uh, metadata for that block. Uh, and that's about it. I don't think there's anything like a too complicated here. We have to like obviously uh, add this around as we go, right? Whenever we uh, add a block, whenever we apply a block to our blockchain, we have to use this uh, concatenation operator we defined uh, to concatenate uh, the new block metadata uh, to the existing chain, right? Uh, but that's uh, not too bad. And then for the wallet itself, uh, now we just need to keep track of uh, our block metadata uh, for our current blockchain. And also because, so remember, so you might notice that these are uh, within uh, a list, right? And remember the list is because of the checkpoints. But because the uh, transaction metadata is independent uh, of the checkpoints, right? It lives outside in its own world. And that's why it's not within uh, these parentheses. And so this is why, like, for example, when you roll back, uh, you see we roll back the block metadata, but we do not roll back this uh, transaction metadata. And uh, here, I just talked about some things that could be static metadata, uh, such as transaction ID, amount, inputs, outputs, stuff like that. Uh, and there's some information based on the chain status uh, that kind of tries to lay out for what is block metadata. Uh, if you want to read into this and think about it, you can, but I think if you probably like, pause the video, think about it for a few seconds, you can think of some examples, uh, like uh, which ones would be which. Uh, the only thing that's kind of interest in here uh, that I didn't mention, right? So for example, like one of them would be like how deep a transaction is, is like, it depends on the chain. Uh, one thing is that uh, figuring out if something is a change address or not is actually more complicated than you would think. Uh, because uh, what does it mean for something to be a change address, right? Well, it has to belong to us. It has to uh, exist in only uh, one confirmed transaction uh, where all the inputs uh, refer to something we own, stuff like that. And it's kind of probabilistic because it's possible that somebody like on purpose reuses one of their cha uh, change addresses, right? So you can imagine maybe I have a transaction, I sent it to Alice and here's my change. And then just because like uh, I want to, you know, mess with it, uh, I could also like, uh, cause this will give you an address, right? Uh, from the UTXO, you could end up like uh, using this uh, to try and like uh, get another uh, thing and then like add some input from another block uh, into your address. Uh, and if you if you try and like uh, mess with it in like a certain way, uh, this uh, probabilistic uh, data structure will not really work out. Because uh, you can imagine like, you know, uh, for this thing, you also have another transaction going here or something. Like, uh, if, if, if you want to mess up with this uh, metadata to get it to be false, uh, even though it actually it was originally change address, uh, you can do that. Uh, but it, it does not, like, affect anything in a bad way. This is not, like, an attack on the protocol or anything. It'll just give you, like, whenever you try and call the API to see if it's a change address, it'll just give you the wrong number. Or sorry, the wrong value, true or false. Uh, but it's just something to think about that, like, uh, kind of interesting that the whether or not something is a change address in the UTXO uh, is a slightly complicated and probabilistic. I shouldn't even mean not probabilistic, but, like, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a function that may may not be accurate. Right, okay, and then moving on uh, to transaction status. Uh, and this is just kind of giving us an overall view uh, 
of kind of what we were talking about in the rollback uh, section, which is whenever you create a new pending transaction, uh, you get to the applying state. Uh, whenever you apply the block, you go into in US block. And remember in the blockchain, uh, usually you want to wait a certain amount of time before considering a transaction or a block uh, stable, right? So for example, in Bitcoin, you usually wait like a six transactions is usually the most common, or it's not six transactions, sorry. Uh, six blocks is usually the most uh, common number. So when something is six blocks deep, you assume that uh, it, it, the history is fixed. This will never change ever again. So that's what this represents here, right? Which is why we apply block back into the same state. So for Bitcoin, we would like go into the newest block, we'll go around here six times, and then finally we would consider this transaction uh, persisted. Uh, and then whenever, so this is like when we send a transaction, whenever we, we receive a transaction, right? We receive money from somebody else, uh, it's slightly simpler. We just go into the news block once it's been like there for six blocks in the case of Bitcoin. Uh, then we assume it's persisted and we have truly received the money. The other thing is that we have this uh, won't apply state. Uh, that This is like the tricky part that they're trying to point out, which is to say it's possible due to some network considerations uh, that a penny transaction never works out, right? So maybe it, uh, you attempted to apply the transaction for one day, but just it can never go through for network problems. Uh, you would just give up on and say, okay, this transaction is done. It's not going to go through for whatever problem and you give up, which means won't apply. Another thing that could happen is that uh, you create a pending transaction uh, and then later on due to a rollback, uh, you move to another chain where this pending transaction is no longer possible because some dependencies no longer exists. Then you'd also move into one ply and uh, they have more discussion on these kinds of stuff uh, in the paper if you're interested in. Uh, so nearing the end, uh, now we're talking about uh, transaction submission layer. Uh, so the idea for this is that we want to have the ability to uh, resubmit transactions. Uh, so for example, if a pending transaction has not been included in a block for, you know, two hours, then maybe something went wrong and so you'd like to resend it, okay? And so this is done by a transaction submission layer, which is like an independent from your actual wallet. And so this uh, transaction submission layer has uh, three main functions. One of them is you add pending. So you take a set of transactions and the existing submission layer and you add these transactions into the uh, submission layer, right? Which gives you a new, a new state. The other one is would be remove, which you would call uh, whenever a pending transaction has uh, finally been included, or you may also uh, imagine it's called whenever uh, you decide something can no longer be applied. Uh, do some random failure case. And the next function is called tick. And tick, what it does is it says, okay, uh, given our set of sub, uh, submission, our, our submission layer, uh, find any transactions that have timed out, right? So uh, maybe five pending transactions have timed out and they get removed and added to this, like a say here. So these are transactions that uh, we've given up on and this is our new submission layer uh, with everything that's remaining. The reason we want to return these uh, as an output is because uh, imagining you're like a wallet UI, you'd like to probably like a, give up a, a warning to the user. It says like warning, uh, you know, pending transaction, blah, blah, blah failed after two hours, uh, gave up on submitting. And so that's why this tick function uh, returns you anything that failed. And uh, they talk about the interface a bit, but essentially how it works is that uh, 
you could implement it whatever way you want, uh, such that you know you could do this based off exponential back off or uh, simply like linear uh, strategy uh, where you essentially, uh, whenever something fails, you, you cancel a transaction and uh, whenever you cancel a transaction, uh, you would essentially have to map cancel onto all the checkpoints uh, to make sure uh, even if you roll back uh, the blockchain or whatever, you don't actually re-add back in this paying transaction. Because remember, like uh, in our rollback method, like we would add to our pending transaction set, right? As we would roll it back. So to make sure that if you cancel something here, to make sure it doesn't, it, I mean, to make sure it stays canceled, even if you have to roll back, you need to map the cancel function onto uh, your entire list of checkpoints, right? Uh, so you cancel from here, and then you cancel from here, and then you cancel it from here all the way up to make sure it's truly canceled. Right, and to cancel a transaction, it's simply you just remove it from. So this slash here means exclude. You exclude it from the list of pending. So this is like a slightly tricky part. Just remember, you cannot cancel it only in the latest block because the rollback may mess with you. So you have to cancel it from all apparent blocks also. So here they just talk about uh, how to set this up, uh, which we'll see kind of in a more uh, digestible format here. So this is kind of the uh, submission layer implementation, how it looks like. So you have some sort of schedule and the schedule uh, contains a list of transactions and this uh, mapping to a number is how many times you tried to resubmit it, right? So you can imagine you have like a transaction zero, you've tried to resubmit it two times, transaction one, you've only submitted it one time, transaction three, you've submitted it like, I don't know, two times also, something like that, and that represents your schedule up here. And then you also have some uh, resubmission uh, parameter, right? Uh, which essentially you take in your schedule and you try and figure out uh, based off uh, this mapping here, uh, which functions to exclude from your schedule and which ones to keep in uh, to decide like uh, you'd want to resubmit these ones and uh, this is like your remaining state, right? So for example, if you decide that uh, anything that's been retried twice uh, should uh, fail or something, uh, this is essentially what you would use. Uh, you would say like a greater than two as your uh, requirement. Uh, right, so you can use this to uh, figure out when to exclude transactions and then you would also resubmit based off uh, the tick that we saw earlier. Right, so the tick would be like a Sorry, if I bring that back. Uh, like the tick in here uh, basically represents uh, some sort of time interval, which is uh, up to the wallet implementation. Uh, but for example, you could say like a one tick is 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, uh, you increment your counter and decide uh, what to do. Right, and just to keep in mind that the tick does not need to match the actual uh, block time of the blockchain, right? So in Cardano, it's 20 seconds, uh, but you could define a tick in your resubmission to be 10 seconds or one minute or an hour. And uh, this is essentially what you would use to figure out uh, when to resubmit and then also when to uh, reject transactions so in your tick, you would have like a set of drop transactions. So these are like the two concepts you you balance around. One is like a, how long it's been uh, since your last tick and how many times you try and resubmit uh, before essentially abandoning, abandoning the uh, calculation. And so, yeah, this can be done with something like a time to live uh, exponential back off or whatever.
And that's kind of how the submission layer uh, works. So next up is input selection. Actually, uh, IOHK has a completely different document uh, about input selection. Uh, so this would be a good topic for a different video. Uh, but in this paper, they uh, very briefly try and mention why input selection is important in UTXO. So you remember because of the way UTXO model works, you may have like a different UTXO that you could use for a transaction. Maybe you have like three BTC here and 0 0.1 here and like five here. And you want to send like a two BTC to somebody, right? Uh, you have a few different options. Right, you could take just the three and then split it in two and one. You could take the five and split it to two and three. Or if, if for some reason you wanted, you could take the 0 0.1 and the three, combine them together, and then you would send the two here and then a 1.1 to a new address, right? And the reason this is uh, important is because you can use this to get rid of dust what they call dust, which is to say like a, some small number that will never be used by itself. And you remember every UTXO you have in the blockchain increases the memory usage and the runtime of your algorithms. So you want to try and uh, reduce dust in the UTXO. So that would be a reason why you want to like group stuff together. Uh, why you use three instead of five is because if you use a number that's close to the number you're sending, then it's easier to differentiate, or sorry, it's hard to differentiate if you sent money uh, to somebody else or back to yourself, right? So imagine like uh, you have, you know, a thousand BTC in an address, right? And you use an online store uh, that requires like, a, you know, a one BTC to purchase uh, something, right? Then your change address would end up being a 99 or 999 BTC change, right? According to the UTXO model. Uh, but that means as, as an external observer, somebody looks into the blockchain, I can say, okay, he sent in a thousand and got back 999. So this is with very high probability, his change address and it's very low probability that he bought something worth 999 Bitcoins, right? And so if you make sure that these values are similar, Right, the change in the actual purchase are close enough in value that an external observer would not know which one uh, was the change address and which one uh, was the actual address of the shop or like a receiver of the payment. So there's like there's a few different considerations. Uh, I went through some of them. Uh, you also take into account transaction fees. Uh, you have to take into account uh, the size of your transaction, right? Because if you group stuff together like this, then your transaction will be larger. And uh, the larger your transaction is, the larger your transaction fees are, uh, all this kind of stuff. So they have a paper, a different, or not a paper, but like a different uh, document on this topic. Uh, but it's kind of like the rationale for why this is an important problem. Uh, and then, yeah, the last thing is just transaction fees, uh, where they just briefly mentioned that uh, transaction fees are proportional to the size, or sorry, the number of bytes uh, that your transaction takes. You can also have like a minimum fee uh, for your blockchain, which represents uh, like if you take data and you serialize it, you calculate a size, then like uh, your blockchain would have some sort of function f which uh, gives back the a fee per byte right so if you say every byte for example in you know cardano may be worth let's say like one ada this is like way too big but like imagine right you say one byte equals one ada and so whenever somebody sends a transaction you would do like uh, f times the number of bytes uh, so you would end up getting like some uh, fee uh, for the transaction. And usually the way transactions are set up is that there's also like an additive term that's like not really mentioned here. But like if you want to send like a 500 bytes 
uh they would also add in like a fixed term of like uh you know uh five eta so in this model like uh no matter what you send you'd always pay at least five and then plus like uh 500 bytes times one eta so you'd always send like uh in this case you would send 505 eta as a transaction fee right and this is kind of what they're talking about here uh and that's what they mean by like the minimum fee uh, and transactions fees for the system. And that's it for the wallet spec. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned a bunch of stuff. Uh, if you have any uh, comments, feel free to leave comments on YouTube, uh, message me on Twitter, all this kind of good stuff. Uh, and keep in touch with me on Twitter and YouTube uh, for more updates in the future.